look what the cat dragged in. I guess that's not accurate. Fat Alice dragged in a cat. What do we have here? We have a Caterpillar tow motor, and that's about the extent of my knowledge on it. I picked this thing up back in the spring with all those tire service trucks that I had bought. The guy was already offering me a pretty good deal, but the fact is I really just didn't want the tire service trucks. He just kept pestering me to buy them. So he, uh, he offered me a good deal and I threw this thing in as a sweetener. I saw it sitting there, I said, fine, throw in the forklift, you got a deal. As you guys are probably well aware, we already have a forklift. The old Alice Chalmers here is a forklift that I picked up for $200 off of Facebook Marketplace, I don't know, three, four years ago now. I've done a bunch of videos on this thing. Well, I don't know about a bunch, but I've done a few videos on this thing uh, way back in the early days of the channel. So if you guys are interested, you could look around and find those. I kind of saw this forklift sitting there and thought it's a good size to replace that Alice Chalmers forklift because she is pretty sloppy. And the nice thing about this forklift is it has pneumatic tires. So you can do a little bit, a little bit of running around outside uh, on some pretty compacted surfaces. You're still not gonna go running around in the dirt too well, but out on the driveway and the gravel and stuff, you can actually get around a little bit versus solid hard tires on that other forklift make it all but impossible. So the guys at the tire shop where I got this thing told me that they used to use it and they parked it for a starter, I wanna say, but it's been sitting for many years outside in the weather. So. Who knows what's wrong with it currently. I have not touched it. It's just sat outside the shop here all summer. So let's dive into this thing and see what we got. If anybody knows why Caterpillar calls their forklifts tow motors versus forklifts like everybody else in the world, drop a comment down below and let me know because I have always wondered that. I'm not sure what this goofy hydraulic line thing is that's strung up around the canopy. I don't know what the deal with that is, so we're gonna have to look into that. It does have side shift, which is another nice feature in a forklift. I like that. Uh, the Alice Chalmers forklift does not have side shift. The forks are in good shape. They're not all worn out. The heel uh, on the forks on the Alice Chalmers are pretty worn down. These ones appear to be in pretty good shape. Tires are all holding air, it looks like. I think the seat's in pretty rough shape on this thing. I don't know where this came from. Oh, it came off of here. I'd have to weld that back in if we're worried about it. But only if this thing runs. It is a high and low transmission, which is nice. And they have it so nicely bungee corded up into high. So apparently you don't want to use low too often. You've got your raise and lower, you've got your tilt, and you've got your side shift function there. And this is forward and reverse, it feels like. Oh yeah, just the nicest seat cushion you ever did see. <laughs> I'll throw that in the trash. She's full of leaves currently. All right, let's finally have a little peek at the engine, see what we're working with here. Okay, that doesn't hinge like I thought it did. Well now, what do we have here? We got the hood off, we're having a little peek here. The first thing that sticks out to me, the distributor, the cap on it has a lovely hole punched through it, which I checked, lines up directly with one of the uh, seat mounting bolts. So somebody probably just tossed it on there and bang, she knocked a hole in the cap. So that's a problem. This cross member here that runs from this hole to that hole and supports the seat it looks like. Well, first of all, it's got a bunch of modification going on that I don't quite understand. Second of all, it's very clearly been rubbing a hole on our top radiator hose here. Actually, I think this is the thermostat housing. Hopefully it's not done any damage, but it definitely looks wet around there like it's been leaking. Where's the dipstick? There we go. Do we have any oil? <laughs> not a drop. Well, I guess there's literally one drop all the way down at the bottom there. That's not great. 
I want to reiterate at this time that I have not heard this engine turn over. I don't know anything about its running condition or lack thereof. So the thing could be smoked for all I know. Let's check the antifreeze. If I can get the cap off without slicing my hand open. Arrgh! Come on. It's a radiator cap. How hard can it be? There we go. Um, I can see the residue of coolant, but I can't see any actual liquid. And looking at the radiator cap, it is pretty darn nasty in there by the looks of things. Lovely. So that really could use like pressure washed and flushed. But the system must not be empty if I can see the fresh residue of coolant. It probably sloshed around while I carried this thing in. Any other notable observations here? Uh, for what it's worth, the hour meter reads 9,398 hours. Hard to say if that's accurate or not. I would say probably is. That seems about right, you know, 10,000 hours for a machine of this age. I haven't run the serial number through CAT, but I'm going to guess that this thing's probably like a mid to late 70s. Let's check our hydraulic reservoir. Also empty. <laughs> uh, well, maybe, maybe one little drop there at the end of the dipstick. Tires on this side look like they're also holding air and inflated, so that's good. I'm sure the battery is stone dead since they told me this forklift has been sitting for many years without any attention. So, where's the key switch? Oh, there we go. Yeah, that feels like a contactor. All right, well, I guess we're gonna go ahead and throw a battery charger at it and see if we can do anything with that battery. It is an interstate, so maybe we have a chance of bringing it back. Highly unlikely, though. But we'll get some juice to it with a good battery charger and see if this thing cranks over. I finally just noticed this Caterpillar tag up here. It tells you the model. So we're dealing with a 510P, as in Paul, and it's a Type G, whatever the heck that means. What are we rated to lift here? Truck capacity. Looks like 2,250 pounds, so that is not... Oh, 25 over here. Oh, okay, so this is the maximum capacity of the truck itself and then the capacity as equipped. So we have a standard mast that necks us down to 2,250 pounds by the looks of it. So that's not nearly as much, actually, as the Alice Chalmers forklift. I think that one's rated to lift 5,000 pounds, which is pretty impressive for a machine as small as it is. But that little sucker is heavy. Yep, 5,000 pounds on the tag of the Alice Chalmers. All right, so we got the big honky tonkin battery charger hooked up on this thing, and you know it's one of those old battery myths that you can uh, kind of desulfocate them by hitting them with a big charge. So we're just going to go put her straight on to 225 amp start mode there, put her in the holding pattern. That'll dim the lights. Now I think this is our ignition switch kind of thing over here. I think this is a start button. Oh, yep. Yeah. Contact. Oh yeah. Something's happening. Sounds like the solenoid in the starter is hitting, uh, but the starter, no go. Now that could be a bad starter, but it could also be a bad solenoid that's not actually getting power to the starter. So we could potentially put a bar across that solenoid, jump it directly, and maybe have some different results. All right, I've got a screwdriver that I don't mind sacrificing to the sparky gods. Ooh, yep, things are angry down here. The lights really did dim when I do that. <laughs> We're knocking her down to 50 amps. 225 seems a bit feisty for this size of an apparatus. All right, let's see what happens here. Contact. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the starter is getting power, but she's not spinning. So is the engine locked up or is it just a bad starter? At this point, I don't know. Also, this is probably a great time to tell you that what I just did was really stupid and I didn't think about it until I shut the camera off. So you got a stone dead battery here and I was just cranking a ton of amps into it. Now what happens when you do that is you actually end up producing hydrogen gas and the battery will start to off gas hydrogen, which as you may or may not know is extremely flammable and explosive actually i believe in concentrations and so we got a battery right here off gassing hydrogen and i was making sparks right next to it with a screwdriver that was dumb don't do that kids i have 
seen batteries explode and take people out and I've tried to bring a couple back using a welder and I actually made a couple blow up on my own too. So not a good time. It sounds like a shotgun going off in your ear and you get covered in battery acid and everything else. So don't do that. Hopefully you guys can see this fan. Hard to get in on it. That engine might be turning, but it is tight if it is. Really hard to uh, get your arm in there to put any leverage on it. Certainly no way to get a bar in there and put it on any of the bolts or nuts or anything. I think we're gonna go ahead and try to pull some of the plugs out and soak the engine down with some penetrating oil since it's been sitting for a long time. And while that's sitting, we can go ahead and work on pulling that starter. They've already gone ahead and labeled the plug wires for us so we don't have to worry about remembering where they go. Ta-da! Well, I mean it's broken for sure and we should replace it, but I think we might be able to get it to run today without replacing it because it hasn't damaged any of the critical pieces we need in here. Though things do definitely look pretty corroded and worn. Under the cap we have our uh, I can get it off of there. <sighs> Man, we have a rotor down here. I can't get the thing off of there. We're going to need to get a little pry bar on that. It's pretty corroded and oxidized as well. Once I get that off, underneath this cover should be the points, which I am certain are going to need cleaned or replaced because I think water has been getting down inside of the distributor. Hopefully enough water hasn't gotten in here to actually go down inside of the engine. I don't know if that's even possible, but I'm kind of thinking it is. And if water got into the engine, we could have bigger, bigger issues here. I have grabbed the wrong size socket. You guys see that things do not look good in there I am feeling less optimistic about this definitely water in the cylinders every one of these spark plugs is rusted and this one here even looks wet oh man I was feeling good about this too now not so much shoot a bit of penetrating oil into each cylinder here let it kind of do its thing, hopefully. I'm actually going to jack up the side of the forklift here to hopefully allow that penetrating oil to get over to the cylinders, not just sit around the valves like it is right now. There we go. You just snap the bolt off, and then there's no more need to worry about loosening it up. All right, with the battery out of the way, we can see what it's going to take to get the starter out. Looks like just a couple wires up top there we have to disconnect and then there are two bolts holding the starter into the bell housing. One there and one directly below it. And you might say, hey Matt, why don't you pressure wash these things before you work on them? This particular one, I probably would. If I knew that we would be getting into all of this, it would be great. I, I really didn't think we were gonna be dealing with water in an engine and everything else. I thought this was gonna be a cakewalk. I should have known better. The other reason I don't is because, well, you can't tell looking out those little windows, but it's like, you know, really cold outside. I think it was 27 this morning when I got up. So I'm not firing up a pressure washer and working in uh, freezing temperatures. So we're just going to deal with a little bit of grease. It's not going to kill us. You can just barely get a wrench on this top one. I'm going to back it off pretty good until it's just hanging in there. Hopefully we can finagle this thing out of here. There we go. Not too bad. Ooh, this thing is nasty. Look how absolutely disgusting this starter is. Just caked with grease and grime. And even inside the bell housing, apparently there's a lot of grease. So I guess maybe the rear main seals going out of this engine, filling up the bell housing and slinging it everywhere. The entire engine, as you can see, is just coated 
with about an inch of grease and nastiness. So she's a leaker, that's for sure. On the contrary, the Alice Chalmers forklift does not leak that bad, so I guess that's another strike against this unit. Well, I went ahead and threw the starter and the bench vise here. I'm going to go ahead and try to bench test it and verify that the starter is the issue. All right, now I should just be able to jump one of these terminals, and it should go contact. All right, so we do have a starter issue. That's good, actually. So right now what I'm doing is I'm trying to run it the way it would in the machine. I've got power coming into the solenoid and then I'm actually actuating the solenoid by, by arcing out that terminal and the solenoid is working in the sense that it is shoving the Bendix out as you guys saw. So what happens is there is you're energizing the solenoid which is basically just a big electromagnet and it slams a plunger forward which shoves out that Bendix but at the same time the plunger is also a contactor and it should send power down to the starter then to spin the starter as the Bendix engages. Now we're not getting any spinny spinny, so let's check and see if we get any spinny spinny. Yeah, so the starter works. The starter spins, but something's going wrong inside the starter solenoid nodding it, not spinning it when you engage it like it should. So we'll have to tear that solenoid apart could just be the contactors all nastied up in there. We might be able to just clean it up and have a good working starter. But I'm more concerned about our engine right now. Let's just verify that the engine is not stuck. That's the big thing. Hey guys, just want to interrupt the video real quick to remind you guys that the holidays are rapidly approaching here. So if you were thinking about picking yourself up any Diesel Creek merchandise from the store, the sooner you can do that, the better. Beat that holiday rush if you guys are interested in picking something up for yourself or a friend or a loved one. Dieselcreek.com, get there before the holiday rush. Link's down below. So in a car or a truck, you can almost always get a bar on the engine, either the front of the crankshaft or you know a drive shaft, something like that. On a machine like this, there's really no way to do that. So you have a hydraulic pump on what is the front of the engine and there's no way to put a, a socket or a wrench or a bar or anything on there to spin the engine and the back is tied into your transmission so there's no way to put anything on that end you maybe could get like i tried to do you know you, you twist the engine with the fan try turning the fan and you might get the engine to spin over that's a possibility but since we just pulled the starter out, now we have the hole into the flywheel and hopefully I can get a bar down there on those flywheel teeth and verify that this engine is not stuck. I'm really hoping that's the case. All right, so this could be our make or break test here. You guys see the teeth on the flywheel there? Uh -huh. I saw a little movement. Oh, but not a lot. Uh-oh, things are not looking good here. Ah, yes, yes, it is indeed spinning. Great success. It doesn't seem very happy about it, but it is turning. That is good to see. Yeah, she's turning now. She was definitely stuck, but not very hard. It didn't take... Uh, a whole lot of pressure on the bar, I guess, to get it to go, but once it did, it turned a lot easier. I hope this shows up in the video. If you're kind of an industry nerd like I am, if you can see that right there, it says B-E-T-H-L-E, -E, I believe that that is. If you see that right there on that piece of steel, it says Bethel, and then it's cut off, I believe that that probably said Bethlehem steel, and that piece of angle iron that they used when they manufactured this thing was from Bethlehem Steel, and there's a good chance that most of the steel in this machine is from Bethlehem Steel, if that one piece is, so that's pretty neat. So to me, that's a really neat piece of uh, Pennsylvania Steel Town history there, so I really don't want to scrap this thing. Hopefully we can get this engine running and uh, get it back into operational condition. Well, we wouldn't want to get our nice clean workbench all dirty, so I'll put down a pig mat, and we're going to clean up this starter, and then we're going to crack open that solenoid and have a gander inside. All right, after our much needed bath there, our starter is looking much, much nicer. And I'm pretty confident that the issue is going to be in this solenoid. So let's go ahead and pop it off. It looks like we're going to need 
couple five sixteenths and that's it. There we go. I couldn't remember how to take that apart, but apparently twisting it was the answer. Let's take the cover off this and see what's inside. Back in the good old days, and maybe somewhere still today, you can just go buy this particular solenoid and put it on the starter. You don't need to replace the whole thing. That is becoming more and more of a challenge these days as less and less people are rebuilding things. They just buy a whole new starter, which even though you guys have seen, there's nothing wrong with the actual starter. It spins just fine. The issue has to be in here, but they don't want to sell you this $30 part. They want to sell you this $200 starter. Yeah, so could be our issue right here. This contactor plate is supposed to be nice shiny copper. It is very tarnished, very blackened. Same thing with the stud that's supposed to engage on there. It is also extremely tarnished, so we're going to clean up all those surfaces. I'm not sure if that is our only issue here, though. All right, so a quick and dirty breakdown of how this thing works. With the cap installed, all these components are is sitting in here like so. So you have constant power on this stud, and it is hovering here midair like this. This wire is your starter wire. This put the key into the crank position, or you push the start button, or whatever it is. 12 volts comes down into this sensing wire. It goes down, energizes this coil. What that does is engage this plunger over here on the starter. It kachunks backwards. So when the plunger comes out, your Bendix is engaged, and then it also, at the same time, it bridges the gap between these two studs and you flow your 12 volts or 24 volts, if it's a bigger starter, down into the actual starter motor, which drives the starter gear, cranking your engine. So I think all we have to do to fix this thing here is clean up this contactor plate and the back side of these studs where the contactor plate contacts. We got that solenoid all rebuilt there, and I am feeling fairly confident that we are going to have a working starter now. At least I sure hope so. I get a piece of copper wire now, and all I'm going to do is bridge the voltage from this positive coming into this small terminal over here, and it should run. You ready? Contact! <laughs> Oh yeah, baby, we got us a working starter. Let's get this thing reinstalled. I hope. There we go. All right, the starter is all reinstalled. We are ready to go ahead and see if this thing kicks over. Could be a pretty good show. I put a good bit of penetrating oil down on those cylinders, and if it spins it over nice and quick, it's probably gonna blow it everywhere. So I'm gonna stand back. You guys watch your eyes. Contact. Oh, bad connection. Try that again. Take two. Contact. Oh, it was in reverse. It started going. This thing must be a direct drive. Let's try that again. Third time's a charm, ready? Contact. Spinning over pretty good. Next thing we're gonna have to do is pry this rotor cap off the distributor, clean up those points, because I guarantee we don't have any spark right now. Now, like I said before, we should probably just go ahead and replace all this stuff anyways but for just trying to get this thing running you don't want to go dumping a bunch of money into it until you know it runs and this stinking rotor is on here nope there it goes it broke look how rusted that thing is on there not good not good at all oh yeah but the points in here are ugly. Oh yeah, baby. 
Nice. Nice clean spark by the looks of it. I also took the liberty of cleaning up all the contact points in our cap and the rotor. So while it would be great to replace this stuff, I'm going to just try to get it running right now with what we got. While these plugs have a little bit of oxidation on them from like rusty water in the cylinders or something, they are not very bad. They'll definitely be good enough to get this thing going. They're not carboned up or anything, although propane machines rarely, rarely ever are. Propane does a really good job of burning nice and clean. And if you think I'm not going to run these spark plugs in with the impact, you've lost your mind. Cylinder three, cylinder four, two, and one. I cleaned up all the contacting points inside the distributor, the cap, the rotor, the points. We seem to have spark at the points, so theoretically we should have it out here at the plugs. So it's, uh, it's go time. I'm going to give it a little whiff of ether since I don't even have a propane tank on here yet. And as I came over here to do that, I realized that there's no air filter in this unit. So who knows how long it hasn't had an air filter, but I'm sure that wasn't good for it. So here goes nothing. You guys ready? What do you think? Is it going to fire up? I'm excited. I hope so. Contact! That's not good. Contact. We do have spark at the plugs. Let's try this again. Take two. Contact. Kind of seems like we should be turning over faster than we are. I'm hearing some gargling, slurping sounds coming from the intake whenever it's cranking over, so. I guess it's possible we have a bit of rainwater hanging down there in the intake boot. I'm gonna try to pop that off and see what the story is down there. <laughs> well, yes, yes, I should have recorded that, I suppose. There was indeed a bunch of water in that intake boot. As soon as I pulled it off, it all came pouring out of that uh, throttle body there. Also, I think I mentioned earlier in the video about hoping that this was a multi-fuel unit, and it is not. That is not a carburetor, that is just a throttle body. So all it does is regulate airflow into the engine. I bet you we can maybe get some ether to this thing now and have a little better shot at getting her going. Well, let's try this again. With the boot off, I should be able to spray the ether directly into that intake. Let's give her a go. Contact. Still not happy. All right, I managed to cram a big group 31 here, a Caterpillar battery nonetheless that I happen to have laying around. So I crammed that battery in there. I've got the boost pack on there. Let's go ahead and give her another go. Hopefully she cranks over a bit faster. Contact. <laughs> well, that's the first little pop we got out of it. That's something. All right. I'm feeling better. All right. Yep. The ether bunny doesn't seem to be doing it for us. Figure we'll give the propane a try. All right. Let's give this a go. Temp number like 12, I think, maybe? I don't know. Numbers are out the window. Contact.
Come on, baby, you can do it. Come on! Boy, it is close. It wants to go. And we're getting fire on like one or two cylinders, but we're just not getting enough to make her light. Try giving her just another little whiff of ether. Contact. What I think is going on here is that there was indeed moisture in this engine and maybe the valve seats are a little corroded, maybe not giving us the best seal, best compression. So that could be kind of hurting our cause. After it comes alive and kind of hammers in those seats, it probably will clear up good enough. You know, we're not doing an overhaul here. We're just trying to get the thing running. Probably the best course of action would be to take the head off clean up the valve seats as best we can, but we're not getting into all that today. Replacing the ignition system would probably be a good place to start too. The plug wires themselves are fine, but we definitely need a new cap, new rotor. That could actually be something else to check is the timing. Because our rotor is broken, the timing could be getting off a little bit. Ah, yeah, I don't think the rotor is sitting on there right. I'm gonna go dig through some parts and see if I can't come up with another rotor about the same size. I can't find a replacement rotor around here that's anywhere close to this one. So if I really want to replace it, we're going to have to go on a parts run. See, because our rotor is busted, I think what's happening is basically the rotor is getting out of time on the distributor shaft. And if it's out of time, it's never going to want to fire. That's why we're just getting a little bit of popping and not a lot of running. Stopping down at Napa, get some more oil, cap and rotor, and we'll be all set. See you, Jack. You'll be here at some time. Yeah, I'll be here at some point. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right, well, we got back from our parts run at Napa. They did have a new rotor to replace our busted one, so we don't need that one anymore. Now, our cap, they didn't have a replacement for that in stock, but it will be here tomorrow morning, but I'm impatient, so we're going to slap a new rotor on it. Run with the old cap for right now and see if this thing will fire up. Fancy pants new rotor. Broke down piece of junk cap. Some plug wires going on here. All right. Fingers crossed this thing hopefully will fire up now since we should have the rotor in the correct timing, not wiggling all over the place because it's busted. All right. Take number 783. Contact. Oof. Our starter changed noises there. That didn't sound good. Right row. Wonder what that's about. Hmm. We had a couple little better pops there, but still, it kind of feels like it's only popping on like one or two cylinders. Not enough to make her fully take off. Quick visit from the ether bunny again. See what she does. Contact. ether doesn't seem to make a difference nothing all right next day we've got our new cap got our new sparkulator cap here let's throw this thing on and cross your fingers I hope that this is the magical piece we need to get this thing fired up because all right new distributor cap is installed Plug wires are in, 
Fingers crossed, this thing fires up now. Contact. I do not like when that starter starts making that noise. I can't believe that we can't even get a pop out of this thing on ether. We have good spark on all four plugs. I've checked them all. I think I'm going to go last resort here. We're going to pull all the plugs out again, and then I'm going to do a compression test on each cylinder and see what we're really working with here. This is cylinder number one. Contact. Yeah, I reckon that could be a problem, eh? <laughs> yeah. Cylinder number three. Like 48, 49 PSI, that's not good. Cylinder number two. Really, maybe about 40 PSI, maybe. All right, the last cylinder, do we have compression here? Contact. <laughs> no wonder the thing won't run. So what's the cause of our low compression? Well, my guess is on number four there, the one with zero compression, we probably just have a stuck uh, valve. I would say it's an exhaust valve uh, because I can see the intake valve moving. And the rest of them that have low compression, so two and three, they're both low. Uh, I would say that they probably just have dirty seats. Number one is 90 PSI. I mean, that's not great either, but it should run on that. If they all had 90, I think we'd be running. So how do we fix the valve hang-up issue? Well, the probably the best way would be to pull the head off, but to do that, then we have to drain the coolant system down, we have to remove all the crap off the top of the engine, possibly damage the head gasket and have to get a new one. Well, I mean, you technically should always get a new one, but I've been known to slap them back together and not have any issues. But even barring that route, so I don't have to do all that, I'm just going to try to pull off this side cover on the block here. Since this is a flathead engine, the valves run vertically up to the deck underneath the head. And the camshaft is like right down here in the bottom of this access panel. And we should be able to pull off this small cover and see the valve stems hanging down there. So there's a chance we can wiggle them back and forth, lube them up, get them working better. So I just spent 10 minutes chiseling grease off the bolts. We can get to them now. Let's see if we can't get that cover off of there. Now, if we can get that cover off there, it'll be a miracle because it is caked on there with the grease. Hey, look at that. Ha <laughs> ha. Valves ahoy. Yep, I see our problem. Can you guys see what's going on here? The tappet is down. The tappet is down, but the valve is still up. See, that shouldn't be like that. We'll crank it over and let you guys have a little gander at how this valve train runs. Contact. So how do we get that valve moving again? That's a good question. If you tap straight down on them, they're usually not too stuck, but because we're not tapping straight down, this could be a little more difficult. Basically, I'm just going to put the bar on the, uh, the keeper there, start working it around, and hopefully, hopefully, it just comes right free and we don't have to fight it too hard. Yeah, we got some movement. I should note that this is not the proper way to do this at all. This is kind of the quick and dirty way to do this. And, you know, if it works, it works. Kind of using that screwdriver as a purchase to get the pry bar wedged on. Yeah, look at that. See that? We hit it with some weasel whiz. Soak her down good. 
and then we'll just crank the engine over again and it's probably going to get stuck up there again and we'll probably have to pry it down three four times before it'll start running free on its own but eventually it will contact just keep popping her back down oh it's already a lot easier contact Look at that, we got her unhung. That was way easier than taking the head off. Contact. Alrighty, that is running much better. All right. Let's check our number four compression again here. Contact. Oh yeah, baby. Straight up to 90. That's what I'm talking about. That's fantastic. That ought to really help get this thing lit off, I hope. So here's another trick we can do to try to up our compression. I've got some mid-weight oil in here. I think this is 40 weight if memory serves. And we're gonna squirt some of this oil down into each cylinder. Not a lot, just like one good little pump. And what that's gonna do is that will seal the rings with the oil better and that'll up our compression for a short while. Hopefully just enough to get it started. And then theoretically, once it's running for a while, the rings might open up and start sealing better and up our compression on their own. Try to get this tip jammed in here as best I can. One good pump into each cylinder. I'm just gonna bump it because I don't want to push all that oil back out. I just want to keep bumping it, try and turn it kind of slow. All right, that's about as good as we're gonna get probably. Let's see if we can't throw the plugs in this thing and get it fired up. This is one of those break glass in case of emergency kind of deals. I got a can of this 80% ether, which should give a little more bang. Fingers crossed, let's give her a go. I do not understand what the heck is going on here. We've got spark, we've got compression, we've got fuel. Why won't you start? closest we've come yet which was still not fantastic I'm playing around with the regulator adjustment which should be giving us more fuel I don't know if that's the right move or not honestly at this point I'm just trying things spitballing in the dark here come on baby come on basically set it to where it seems happiest because I can wiggle it to and fro. I can basically advance the timing with the rotor cap, you know, retarding and advancing the spark. I played around with that and this seems to be where it's happiest at. I just need this thing to fire.
it is so close. Like, it's actually kind of firing. The starter's just keeping it going. The exhaust pipe's actually warm because it is firing enough to, to heat up a bit. It just will not stay running. We still have like a dead cylinder. Come on, baby. <laughs> that was close. It was running there for a second. Did you guys hear it? the starter a break. I think I see some smoke coming from it. That's usually not good. Once they let the smoke out, bad. has held on now let me tell you hard. It doesn't sound too good, but I bet you the longer it runs, the better it's going to get on account of the valves will start to seal up better and the piston rings and all that. Let's go ahead and shut her down. Well, it runs. We got it hot. I'm going to go ahead and find an oil drain plug and we'll drain the oil out of this thing. Oh, lovely. There's a puddle of oil on the floor under here. That's nice. I wonder why the heck. I wonder what the heck's leaking. Not a lot of clearance down here to show you guys I'm draining the oil, but I'm sure you've seen oil drained before. Probably not that much in this thing. Ooh, no, there wasn't. And it is. Not good looking oil either. Definitely had some water in it. Ugh, yeah. Man, I'm glad we're getting this sludge out of here. We'll let that drain out. We'll put some good stuff in it and it might stand half a chance. All right, so it's actually the next day I let the oil 
sit and drain overnight try to get all the little drips out of this thing I just picked up a new oil filter from Napa let's slap that on there fill this thing up with some good stuff all right let's see what kind of nastiness came out of this thing overnight oh yeah yeah it's got a lovely brown sludge tint to it can you guys really see that I hope it's coming up on camera oil is not supposed to look like that mmm it's definitely got some water in it it's not terrible I've definitely seen much much worse as far as having water in them so I don't think the water caused any damage but I've just got a feeling that the old Continental in the tow motor here is not not in the best shape There we go. Yep. I put this pig mat down here so that we didn't uh, make a big mess, but it looks like most of the oil was already drained out of this thing. Or it wasn't. Or there was just not enough oil in there to pump up and fill up the filter, which is possible. I didn't think to record draining the other filter, but when I turned it upside down on my drain pan over there to let it drip out, a bunch of water came out of it. Well, that's not ideal. All right. Even though this poor little engine may be hurting, we're going to do everything we can to give it a fighting chance. So I'm going to feed it. The good stuff here, we got Rotella T5, which is the same stuff I run in just about everything. It's got lots of extra additives and stuff in it that you wouldn't get with uh, an oil aimed for a gasoline engine, per se. Especially with these older engines, they like a lot of zinc, and that's one of the things that is in the T5 here. The oil is flowing slow this morning. It is cold outside, not helping our cause. The oil was in the bed of my truck overnight. According to what I found on the Al Gore machine, we hold like four and a half quarts. So if my math's right, that's like uh, a gallon and a third. Unrelated to this video, but a little teaser for you guys, I just got a text from my neighbor saying that the power company looks like they just showed up to install my power. They're sitting at the end of my driveway. So this just turned into the most exciting oil change of my life. Do the old bartender long pour routine. Oh, don't overflow it. Oh, the power company's here. I can see the trucks. Oh, boys. That's one gallon down. Put a little bit more in here, and we'll try to get this thing fired back up and check the level after it fills our oil filter. Contact. Oh, yeah. That's, that's vast improvement already. definitely got more consistent oil pressure just in cranking it we're almost near 20 psi and it's not fluttering all over the place nope better let this start to rest a little bit she is cranky quite literally I'm hoping after we get it running we can actually get this thing up to temperature this time and uh, really let it run and clear itself out. I know those rings and the valves all seating back together are really gonna help us out. I think after it runs for a while, we'd probably be able to get it to restart much easier. At least that's my hope. Let's all take a moment to really appreciate the starter here because it is an absolute champ.
Look how much less smoky it is just from changing that oil. Hardly any smoke. In fact, I don't see any smoke. like that. You give her full throttle, she just shuts right down. I'm trying to get this thing to idle. That might be asking quite a bit. It's definitely uh, a vast improvement over what we had. It's, it's running. Let's see if she's going to restart for us. Seems to just like a little bit more propane than I'm giving it. For the second time now, we have lost spark uh, unexpectedly, so I don't know what the problem is here. We either have a bad coil or a bad condenser, pretty much the only two things that it could be. Uh, basically, they work when they're cold, and then after they get a little hot from operating, something shorts out internally and they go bad. All right, well, I just got back from making another Napa run here. I got us a new coil and a new condenser here. Let's get these installed. So here's our old condenser, and you can test these with a multimeter, uh, which I did. And this one seems to be okay with the multimeter, but the problem we're having here is that we do have spark for a while, and then after everything heat soaks on the engine, then the spark goes away. So that could be our condenser. Uh, something, something can happen internally, and after it gets hot, things short out. Same thing could be happening with the coil, that's why I switched it as well. Alright, now let's put this back together and hope we have spark again. I see spark on the points. Before we try to fire it back up again too, there's a section of the exhaust pipe here that is, is just soft. I know I can stick a screwdriver right through that thing. I don't really want to sink a ton of money into this thing, so I'm not going to try to get that new piece of exhaust rebent and welded on there, replace it or whatever. So we're just going to put a band-aid on it for now. 
And I guess it literally is a band aid. I got a band clamp here. And we should be able to pretty much just encapsulate that soft spot with this band. All right, we got our Band-Aid on a bullet hole right there. Let's see if this thing's gonna fire up. And for the 12 millionth time in this video, contact. All right, I'm editing out a lot of cranking here. This starter is a true champion. I don't know what brand it was. I think it was an AC Delco, but my God, that starter has been putting up a fight. Well, the new coil and condenser seem to be helping quite a bit. This thing's running a lot better. It's still not great, but it's definitely improving. I guess while I got it sitting here running, let's try to see if anything else functions on it. Check this out, I just accidentally found our problem. Something's shorting out in that switch and it, when it touches metal, it's grounding out, killing the engine. So we'll have to pull that cover off there and fix that up. That should be a pretty easy fix. I just happened to notice that. Oh yeah, she's really coming around now. Listen to that old continental wine. Don't die out, baby. Oh, it's actually idling. That's nice. All right, let's see if any of the hydraulics work. Oh yeah, look at that. Tilt's nice. We're pouring water out of something. All the, the cap on the cylinder there. Yeah, but it's working. It's very quick hydraulics, I'll give it that. Much faster than the uh, the old Alice Chalmers. So we have a side shift function, as I explained earlier in the video, but I'm seeing that it's bypassed. That's what this big goofy line is, is looped up around the cab here. I mean, they must have blown a line and just had one laying around so they bypassed it, hooked it back into itself. Interesting. Well, let's see if it drives forward and backwards. We know it should move a little bit because it kind of took off there at the beginning of the video. There's no seat, so this is hard. Seems like... We we could definitely use some power steering fluid. Oh, there's an actual clutch here. Oh, well, it moves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, look at the crap we have underneath of where this thing was. No. Why did you die? What the heck? We're not out of propane. Huh. My god, the oil this thing loses. This was a brand new pig mat after the oil change. It is just pumping nasty oil out of the bell housing. We're gonna have to get some more pig mats on that. Well, I reckon I should probably sweep this up before we try to drive over again and really grind it into the concrete. All right, I don't know why it shut off. Um, I even have a hot jumper going straight to the coil from the battery hot. So I know that this 
you know, ignition switch grounding out is not what's killing us right now. So what is killing us, I don't know. She just kind of stumbled and died out there like it was out of fuel, but I know that we're not out of fuel. Now, will it restart? Oh, why is this hard to get into? Hopefully you guys can see, but all that was happening here was the ignition switch was rotating because the nut wasn't tight. The ignition switch could rotate and this wire here was shorting out to the dashboard. As soon as you ground that out, we would lose spark. All right, so I got my coil jumper on. I know that we have power to the coil, so we should have spark here. I'm gonna test it now with this extra spark plug and see if we got spark. Yeah, once again, no spark. I don't understand. All right, so this thing's been sitting for probably a half hour, maybe 40 minutes. Let's see if it fires back up like it's been doing for us. I don't understand. I don't understand why we keep losing spark. There's literally nothing else to replace in the ignition system. We've replaced all the parts that could possibly fail. I think our best bet here would be just to drive this thing out of the shop and far away. has a little bit higher lift capacity than the Alice Chalmers. The forks are much nicer on it. If those fit the Alice Chalmers, I think we're gonna end up putting those on the Alice Chalmers. Now normally I'd say outside of that she's cherry, but I don't think I even wanna mess with this thing at this point. Can you guys see how fast the oil is just dumping out of that rear main seal? Rotella is some excellent stuff, but I don't think even it can fix that. Well. Unfortunately, I think this is gonna be the end of the line for the old kitty cat here. She has just seen better days. It was used too much when it was new. We have a barely running Continental four-cylinder dumping, I mean dumping, oil out of the rear main seal. We've got a manual transmission in a forklift, which is, let me tell you, not desirable at all. I'm sure there's a whole host of other problems we haven't even uncovered yet, and it's just not worth going forward. Forklifts in my area can be found in better shape than this for about 500 bucks pretty regularly. And if you want a pretty nice one, you could spend maybe 2,000, 3,000. You'd have a 
pretty nice unit. This thing here, well, it's just worth more as scrap, unfortunately. There's some things I'm gonna keep off of it, but most of it, I don't think it's worth anything. I got a buddy that's into those Continental engines. I'll give him a shot at that engine. If he says it's not worth anything, then it's probably not worth anything. It's very clearly worn out, as you guys have seen by the compression test. I'm gonna run a compression test again to see if we gained anything since the uh, non-running part of the video. I am curious about that. I'll post those results here at the end. So here's the silver lining for you people that are gonna be uh, upset that I'm scrapping this thing. And keep in mind, I'm upset about it too. I don't want to scrap it. These forks are in very good shape. You see how this is still nice and thick right here and it tapers all the way down. The ones on the Alice Chalmers, I'll show you in a second, they, uh, they're fatter in the middle than they are back here at the heel, so that means they're worn out. And once they get worn down like that, they would not be allowed on a commercial job site or application. Uh, OSHA would have a field day with that. But basically, it just means that the forks are weakened and they could break. So I'm gonna save these forks since they're in good shape. I did just confirm they will fit onto the, uh, the Alice Chalmers here. Poor old little Alice here, her forks are much thinner from wear, and you can even see what a striking line this is across here. It's not like curved at all. You can see it's just very plainly wore off. There's actually a ridge right here. There's actually a ridge right there where the steel's rolled up from being drug on the ground a whole bunch over the years. There's no telling how old those forks are, but uh, they've seen better days and they're actually bent. They're no longer 90 degrees. I don't know if you can see it in the video. They're a little past 90 degrees, and if you put any kind of serious weight on them, they, they bend down pretty good. So I was carrying around that 671 Detroit with this thing, and they were bending pretty good. I got kind of nervous lifting it up. I was just waiting for one of those things to snap. So new forks are definitely in order, and I'll be happy to put those on here. So here's one of the main reasons we're not interested in replacing this machine with the Caterpillar, even if it was in pretty good shape right here I don't have to press any pedals at all we're going forward and backwards so it's just straight shuttle shift power shift whatever you want to call it that caterpillar you'd actually have to push the clutch change directions and then let the clutch out so if you want to go creeping around you actually have to feather the clutch and uh, it's much more difficult. It's much more difficult when you're trying to do all that and work the boom and pick up a pallet. Having a, a simple shuttle or power shift is uh, much superior. That's why they don't even make any forklifts like that anymore, to my knowledge. Like I said, it's unfortunate. I don't want to do it, but you can't save them all. If you try saving them all, you turn into a crazy cat lady. You guys all know I've got plenty on my plate to keep me busy for a lifetime, so I don't need this thing hogging up space around here. It serves no purpose. It's just a big paperweight at the moment. And, uh, well, it would be pretty low on a priority list. The only reason I even tackled it today was because I was sick of seeing it sit out here in front of the shop. I figured I'd either get it going or get it gone. So I think we're at the get it gone stage of things. <laughs> Anyways, guys, if you've got any better ideas of something to do with this thing before it heads to the great big crusher in the sky, drop a comment down below, let me know. If you guys like the video, be sure you do the whole thumbs up thing down below the video there. It really helps me out. It doesn't cost you guys but a second of your time. If you guys are looking for some Christmas presents for yourself or a friend or a loved one, whatever it may be, head on over to dieselcreek.com, pick yourself up some sweet swag. You can beat the holiday rush. That way you know you have it in time for the big day. That's dieselcreek.com. The link is down in the description. Other than that, guys, I think that's all she wrote. On this very somber occasion, I want to thank you guys for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Later. Well, I just finished running the compression test again since we've had this thing running and heat cycled several times now. I was hoping that uh, I thought it would be interesting to come back and see what kind of compression changes we did have. I know I wrote the numbers sideways. I should be able to switch them in the edit for you. On cylinder number four, we started with 90 PSI. We jumped up to 100 after uh, an oil change and some running. Cylinder number three, we started with 50 PSI. We jumped up to 65 after some oil and some running. Number two here, we had the most significant gains. We started at 40 PSI and ended at 135 PSI. So something really clicked in that cylinder. 
and we were able to jump up. That's currently our best cylinder by, by a landslide. Cylinder number one now was completely backwards from what I thought. We started at 90 PSI, and in fact, now we can only get 70 PSI out of it. I even left it on the gauge there to show you guys. I thought that was weird. That's exactly the opposite result that I would assume. So maybe there's a broken ring in there or something. I'm not, not sure what's going on, but uh, I don't know what the spec is for compression on these four cylinder Continentals, but I can't imagine that it's any lower than 135. I would say that's probably the bottom end of uh, where it's supposed to be. So we're pretty well whooped here. Uh, I, one thing I didn't show in the video, I couldn't really get the camera to pick it up, was there's a ton of blow by coming out of this uh, case breather right here. I mean, when, when the engine's running, you can put your hand there and it's just like wind in your face. I mean, there is just a, a serious breeze coming out of that case breather. So yeah, she's, she's pretty well whooped guys. That's all I can say about it.